the Land Show, guys, the weekly analysis and news show, which uh, is brought to you by Coca-Cola. We have a new sponsor. Actually, no Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola and Pepsi. I actually don't like Coca-Cola. It's not do, very do good. You, do you like Pepsi more? No, or it's you just, terrible. You just don't like Coca-Cola? Neither do I. Yeah, I it's like just Cola. terrible. Cola's weird. Uh, although, it's better than the no-name stuff. Uh, Safeway's house brand, Simply Soda. I remember this one time. I drank one can of it. This is when I was like nine or ten. I drank one can of it before I left and that stuff made me have to pee like nothing else I've ever experienced in my life. So I'm driving down from Whistler. Yeah. We get stuck in traffic on the Sea to Sky Highway. Sounds about right. I peed myself in the car not once, not twice, but three times. How old are you? I was point? like, well there was nothing I could do. There was a cliff on one side there was bumper to bumper traffic. It I'd took piss out the door before I pissed hours myself. and hours to hours and hours to get down. I was like, Dad, what do I do? And he's like, I don't know, just whatever. I hold on to the roof, lean out. And it was, just it piss was a convertible. The There's like so stand up. So yeah, I I, just I don't hold I don't, a bag on each side or skis on I, each side. I don't know about that. You know what? Would love to hear your guys' feedback, whether it's in the <laughs> Twitch chat or whether it's on Twitter. Would you rather embarrass yourself by peeing on the seat or embarrass yourself by standing out in front of the stopped, by the way, traffic? Oh, yeah. Completely just, just stopped put, traffic. Like, put blockers up. Like, just... people stopped and, like, having, like, tailgate barbecues on their trucks with their propane because Probably we're, we're not moving. Up. So do you just pee there? Which, which option is better for you? Um, <laughs> Totally, totally open to feedback here. I, I was, I was too embarrassed to get out of the car. Fortunately or unfortunately, the seats were leather, so at least it was gonna come out. But yeah, it was, uh, it was one of those experiences you have in life oh, that uh, is unfortunate. That was, I was, I was not expecting that start to the win show actually. No, no, I, uh, I, I have never told you that story. In fact, I haven't told that story many times in general. <laughs> it's, uh, not one of those stories that I'm particularly proud of. So we've got a great show for you guys. We have special guest Lou from Unbox Therapy. We've got um, this guy. I do things. This guy. We've got a bunch of great topics, including the uh, the first reviews are out of Asus's 4K monitor, which is extremely exciting. As you guys know, I'm all about the 4K. And leaks of Dell's possible <laughs> <Leaks>. 4K monitor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Leaks of Dell's possible 4K monitors. Uh, Samsung's new 840 Evo SSD. Honestly, from what I've seen, it looks like the only SSD that actually I should give any cares about anymore. It uh, looks unbelievable. As well as Slick's expert uh, you know, correspondent analysis of what Microsoft could do to save Windows 9 to actually appeal to every customer. Have you read it? I have read it. It's actually pretty okay. I don't disagree with you. Yeah. And that's pretty good for me and him. Uh, oh, yeah, my watermark. Where's my watermark? Uh, don't worry, we're going to run the intro. We just finished doing the intro. Diesel's afraid that I'll forget to run his awesome intro that we hardcore love long time. And boom, cue it. <laughs> I missed it. I'm going to try that one more time. So there is the intro. Someone says they hate it. Someone says best intro of all time. So we're going to go ahead and call that. It's all right. 50% of the time, all the time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 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 Whoa. <laughs> brain just exploded. So guys, remember as always, The Land Show is brought to you by Razer Comms, the voice chat client that is actually optimized for gaming and isn't Skype, but also doesn't require you to set up a dedicated server or any of the issues that you might have with some of the other ones that are out there. We actually had a lot of people criticizing our video about why we decided on Razer Comms, saying that, you know, uh, this one's superior or that one's superior, there's another one that's superior. Uh, the reality of it is, Comms is in beta. Um, I have used other voice clients. Uh, for anyone saying Ventrilo was superior, wow, go away, because no, it isn't. 
Uh, Mumble, on the other hand, is outstanding. The only issue with Mumble is that uh, when I used to use it for my... I, I would say Tuesday night gaming sessions, but it was more like every night at that point in my life. <laughs> uh, for for gaming <laughs> sessions, uh, there were some issues with um, with secure channels and with the authentication keys, and it, you had to get like there, you, you could only have like that admin, you know, get you in, and the sort of invites were weird and rooms were weird. Voice quality is outstanding. Yeah. Dedicated server, all that kind of stuff. Um, one thing, like uh, other other voice communication programs, all most of them have at least one thing that separates them. Like Teamspeak, a lot of people like Teamspeak. One thing that a lot of people might not know about Teamspeak, even the people that like it, is that you can integrate it with things like Arma, and set up hotkeys in game, which will talk over certain radio channels. So you can go in like close burst within the game, or like go over a certain channel, even though you're in a cha in the channel with everyone, and like it's. A lot of different things have cool functionality. We're just trying to show that Razer Comms also has its own nice, cool way of going about being a voice comm. So use that bit.ly link, guys. Remember, that uh, helps us out a great deal. If you're going to download Razer Comms and try it, or you're going to get your friends to download and try it, please do use that link. As I said before, it helps us out a great deal. So I would like to go to the Twitter boards. That's what I'm going to call them from now on. The Twitter boards? Where I want to see what people think. I would pee on another person's car. Looking straight in their eyes, not losing eye contact the whole time. Come on, if you're like nine, I don't think so. <laughs> I'd rather let it go out the window. Own your body, man. And then Brian seems to be unrelated. You're going to make me get Instagram, aren't you? Um, I am going to continue using Instagram, so, so that's kind of a thing. And for some reason, I'm not getting any tweets. So, uh, huh. There you go. There's two watching from Texas. Love the WAN show, guys. What should I get? Two GTX. Wow, that went fast all of a sudden. Two GTX 760s or one 780. Also, tell Slick I love his little beard. I don't think that's an intentional beard, is it? What do you mean? The your beard. It's an intentional beard. It's an intentional. I shaved beard? this part. Oh, okay. Well, um, um, I'm trying to enjoy it before I inevitably volunteer for firefighting. Evan and then likes have it. to take it off. You're because, not allowed to have a beard as a firefighter? Well, it will... Your well, skin won't make contact with a mask as well. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah. It, it makes sense, because you need it to be able to stick against your skin. And like we figured out with the ninja mask, my hair pokes through things and stuff. Gotcha. All right, Soren asks for headphones in the 200 to $250 range. You're really happy with your custom one pros, right? Yeah, they're awesome. Hard and they often go on sale around that range. Hard to say no to that. Play modern games on after party. We'll see if we can even figure out playing games on the after party. <laughs> Should I buy a 79.50 now or wait for new AMD cards? No idea. Uh, we don't know. Uh, H100i is intake or exhaust on Phantom 410 mounted in the top. All other fans intake, go ahead and use it as an exhaust. Ducky Shine 3 up for pre-order, ordering mine tomorrow. Ooh. Only certain places have them for pre-order, and a lot of places that have them... Oh, wait, this is Shine 3. Yeah, no, he should be fine. Uh, I was thinking Snake. A lot of them are sold out. All right, going to upgrade to 4770K. Is there any motherboard you'd recommend especially? What is overclocking noob friendly for up to 300 US dollars? Honestly, for 300 US dollars, you can buy pretty much whatever you want. And we have a very exciting video coming soon where we are going to take two Z70, C, uh, Z87 boards. Uh, do you remember which two they are? It's a... Uh, I don't remember the exact model name, but it's a Gigabyte ITX Wi-Fi board. Little board. Pew. Pew, 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 pew. Versus a Rampage Ex Maximus, Maximus 6, 6 Extreme. There we go. So we, uh, we overclock them both, we run some benchmarks, we find out actually in our experience what difference does it actually make uh, versus, I mean, there's always the features that are added by better boards. So example, for example, the Maximus 6 formula has much better onboard audio, yeah. which can save you buying a sound card. With that said, I've always believed that buying a very high quality sound card, because of the way audio equipment doesn't really change much over time, uh, a good quality sound card from three years ago, four years ago, something like an Ozentech X Meridian or something like that, um, Still a good sound card if you can find a PCI slot to put it in. So I recommend, rather than investing in a better board that has better sound, you grab a great sound card and put it in whatever board you happen to buy. It also looks a lot better and aesthetics matter. Yeah, true that. All right, so Unbox Therapy has, uh, has tweeted that he's going to be joining us soon. That's very, very exciting. He's a really great guy. We've actually met in person in the past and uh, enjoyed some uh, pretty, actually it was some pretty suspect like barbecue 
make it yourself food that uh, yeah. yeah we were hanging out with Logan as well so there's some pictures from that trip but uh, it was it was pretty great actually so let's do our first topic of the day shall we sure what do you want to what do you want to hit him with first why let's don't we talk PQ 321 sure sure all right so Anon Tech has one of the first reviews out there of the PQ321Q Ultra HD monitor living with a 31 and a half inch 4K desktop display. So guys, I do highly recommend taking a complete sort of, you know, it probably only take about 15 minutes, 20 it's minutes. Not that long. Read through the review because they touch on some really interesting points about this for those of you who don't know, one of the first 4K desktop monitors that is actually intended to be hooked up to a computer. Yeah. What's your take on this? I read through the review, yeah. and the first thing that I noticed was he said the color gamut wasn't exactly where he hoped it would be. It was almost 100% of sRGB, if I recall correctly, but some of it was in the wrong, yeah. wrong spots. So, so it's exciting because they're getting these lower size 4K resolutions, and one thing that he said is a, he kind of expected um, it to not be that big of a difference because it's so close to him. Yeah. But that he instantly noticed that it was so much sharper. Yes. I mean, I could have told there. Uh, I think uh, Chris. Chris is the reviewer over there that uh, that did this particular write up, and I could have told him a 4K monitor was going to make a very very big difference. But for me to invest thirty five hundred dollars, I mean, I had talked about, you know, maybe I want to go 4K. But the reality of it is, is there's a couple reasons why I'm not ready. Would I be willing to sell my bike and drop all of that money that I get back for it on a monitor? Potentially, yes. Especially then. Mind you, I'm back on my bike for this season, and I'm kind of questioning how I could have ever been crazy enough to think about that. But <laughs> I was going to say, now that it's summertime and you're actually riding it, that's... Yeah. <laughs> but... The the flip side of that, or the but the uh, the other hand of that discussion is yeah it's it's expensive. Would I be willing to drop the money? Maybe, but there's still some problems. Yeah. So the display standards aren't really ready yet for the most part. HDMI is not going to be ready until HDMI 2.0, when we're going to be able to drive 4K at 60 hertz off of a single interface. When I was talking to the ASUS guys that were at Vancouver. Uh, they were saying that part of the reason that they didn't have games running on the one that was there was that they needed some driver hook em, hook em, whatever right. word you want to use for it, in order to have the two display interfaces work uh -oh. correctly yeah. as, a, as, as, as teaming together to drive a single panel. So that to me is a big concern as well, is what happens to this weird niche product that ASUS sells however many they sell, like, I'm not going to say 10, but I'm also not going to say 10,000 in North America anyway. And that's the danger, is what happens to weird niche products that lead the charge on some kind of a new technology and then ultimately get abandoned. Look at the X25M from Intel, of all, of all companies, yeah. and the X25E. Yeah. People invested a ton of money into those early gen SSDs. They never got trim. They never got proper. They never. They never got proper garbage collection, if I recall correctly. I think like so. they just kind of got abandoned because they didn't sell enough for it to be worth the R and D time of fixing it after the fact. And that's a really good point because it's it's prohibitively expensive. Yes. It has its problems. Yes. What I'm excited for is when they get it smaller size because 31 and a half is huge. 31. 30 inches is already like. It, uh, I, I used 30 inch for quite a while and I got used to it but then what happened was I recently switched back to 24 and even though it was noticeable I don't really miss that huge I miss the resolution yeah yeah love to have the resolution back but exactly I'm excited for 24 inch I'm excited to buy two 24 inch 4k monitors that are affordable what do you consider affordable I don't know would you spend seven fifty each? No. Because it's going to be a long time before they're going to be less than that. Yes, but I'm very happy with my current monitors. True, true that. Okay. And I'm totally fine with waiting. So it's you had really, really good points. It's interesting buying in on technology like this. I think I've done it once. I yep. bought a Nia. Okay. It wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't super expensive. It was fun though. <laughs> okay. So it it was fundamentally broken. Yes, it was terrible. But it was fun. Okay. I enjoyed messing around with it. I got my money out of it. I was happy. It got abandoned. That's fine. 
<laughs> okay. Whereas, and I'm not saying that this monitor is not going to work three years from now. Yep. It will. And DisplayPort is a much better solution than, you know, dual HDMI in. But there's all those early growing pains. I mean, early 2560 by 1600 monitors, none of them had on-screen displays. Because the processing chips required to, um, to uh, none of them had scalers. Yeah. So the, because the processing required to do all this stuff was just out of reach. So you just had to drive it natively. Um, and so the on-screen display ain't great on this thing, but one thing that's cool about the, uh, about the PQ321Q is that the input lag isn't bad. Yeah. That's outstanding. It's yeah. about the same as the PB278, which I have two of them incoming when they finally get in stock at the place I've ordered them. Um, and I've gamed on that monitor. Not bad. It's not a CRT, but it's not bad. So uh, that I find really exciting, how close we are from that perspective. But, uh, yeah, I think that's... So it's, it's, it's exciting, and if you have the money, that's great, but... Oof. Yeah. It's, it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. <laughs> it's a lot of money. I saw, actually, it's not in, the, uh, it's not in our WAN show doc, but I saw uh, someone was running three of the Sharp displays uh -huh. uh, in, in iFinity off of a 7970 uh, Matrix or whatever from Asus. So it's like 12K <laughs> display, essentially. It's That's absurd. Unbelievable. He had them on loan, so it's like $10,000 worth of displays, right? Um, that's the other thing that I'm really waiting for with 4K, is more competition. You look what happened with TVs, with Seiko, just kind of yeah. marching in and being like, yo, guys, this doesn't cost that much. Not a great TV. But still. In fact, the reviews are terrible. Yeah. They're basically saying, don't bother, just go get a 1080p TV. But... Um, but I'm waiting for someone other than freaking Sharp to have something other than a 32-inch panel. I mean, that's a professional-geared product in the first place. Well, the, the, the Dell leaks are pretty much just product numbers. Why don't we do that one next? Tell. Sure. It's in here somewhere. Yeah. As far as I could tell with the Dell leaks is that they are basically just product numbers. But one thing that I saw was, I think it was like 2414. And it seemed like they all, all the 4K ones ended in 14. So that got me excited because 24 inch, I'm assuming the first two numbers are inch. So a 24 inch uh, 4K monitor, which is what I'm super excited for. I'm sure it's going to be way too expensive. But yeah. that's, that's the size that I'm excited for. With that said, Dell's been reasonably reasonable about some stuff. So this was submitted on the Linus Tech Tips forum by Snow Comet. So uh, it was a leak in the soundbar manual because their soundbar, I don't know if you're familiar with it, is usually uh, cross compatible with multiple Dell monitors. So here are the leaked models the UP3214Q. 320, so that is in all likelihood a 4K 32 inch using the same IGZO panel as everyone else. That's another thing is when we get more panel manufacturers yeah. playing the game, yeah, that's going to help a lot. The UP2414Q, the U2414H, and then U3415W. So Q might be 4K or whatever else. Fascinating. I, I, I still have... Oh! Oh, just an FYI, guys, this IP is not the IP of the poster. I forgot again to uh, log into a different account. Guys, if you, if you were to watch our streams over sort of a longer period of time, you'd notice that IPs repeat themselves a fair bit because they are the IPs that have to do with the security system for our forum, not to do with the actual members of our forum. So there you go, just throwing that out there. Let's go ahead and uh, move on to our next topic, shall we? NVIDIA has a new Quadro video card. So they just recently unveiled... Ahem. So this was submitted by Ichondo. The Quadro K6000 GPU. So this is based on a Titan GK110 core. It has 12 gigs. I'll let that sink in for a moment. <laughs> 12 gigs of GDDR5 memory. And uh, that makes it pretty much, when it comes to 3D rendering, uh, animation, simulation applications, pretty much the fastest possible GPU that can exist right now. Um, now, we'll talk about that a little bit. So there's a couple of really great, great quotes uh, from Pixar. So this is their... Uh, uh, Vice President of Software R&D, the Kepler features are key to our next generation real-time lighting and geometry handling. If you guys have seen Monsters U yet, you may have noticed that there's a completely different look to that film compared to previous Pixar films because instead of manually um, programming lighting, they're actually having the lighting 
just bounce around the way that it normally would, making it much more natural looking. So we were thrilled to get an early look at the K6000. The added memory and other features allows our artists to see much more of the final scene in real-time interactive form and allows many more artistic iterations. Um, and then uh, Nissan is saying that they can view, they can pull up almost an entire car <laughs> in like realistic life, lifelike realism to, you know, look at things and tinker with it and all that kind of stuff. And then they have another one from Apache. Um, that combined with leap motion could be really cool. Oh yeah, I know, right? Ooh, Computers really are changing. Cool. Computers are changing. Um, so yeah, Apache is uh, energy for energy explore, exploration. They're saying drilling in the wrong place can be a multi-million-dollar mistake, and the K6000 gives the edge to make better decisions. <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's a little bit blunt. <laughs> yeah, it's like yeah, we needed this power. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah, all the dollars just <laughs> <laughs> bye bye. So in addition to all of that, I would like to settle once and for all that just because a graphics card costs $5,000 versus something like a Titan that costs $1,000 and is actually built on the same architecture, that has nothing to do with gaming performance. These cards are not gaming cards. They use workstation grade memory, for example, because you can't afford to make a mistake. They have the full capability of their double precision calculations that they need to do. They have software features that are not enabled on desktop parts. They are binned to a higher degree of quality. They are expected to last longer, run under lower thermal run inside lower thermal envelopes. For example, the Quadro and Diesel's workstation on the desktop side, or for the, for the graphics side, the GeForce side, was a dual slot cooler. His is a single slot cooler because it's a better binned part, and they were able to achieve that with that particular card. So guys, I'm so tired of seeing uh, builds on a PC part picker that are like, yeah, I did an ultimate build, I put in four quadrant. No, you didn't, because that's not for gaming. So there you go. Um, why don't we do a quick Twitter blitz, and uh, I'll, I'll do this blitz while you get uh, Lou on the line. Sure, sure. Do you have the snowball set up? Uh, yep. Oh, oh, well. oh. Um, oh. Uh, I'll figure it out here. Sweet. <laughs> All right, cool. Actually, uh, I've, got, I've, got comms, uh, I've got comms up here. Is, uh, yeah, yeah. Lou's, He's in uh, the channel already. Lou's in the channel already, so we should be ready to go pretty quick after this Twitter blitz here, guys. Here we go. I have an i5-3450. I want to upgrade and I'm a designer. I use Photoshop and Maya. Any suggestions? Um, you know what? You're going to get a bit of a performance increase, especially if you go for something like a K-series processor, a 4670K and overclock it, or even a 4770K, because you will be able to take advantage of hyper-threading. With that said, if, um, if your workloads perform well on an AMD pile driver chip, something like an 8350 is a great value. But... Um, Maybe, you know what? I guess what I'd probably do is 3770K for you because you don't want to change your board and, um, and you're going to get, you're going to be able to take advantage of hyper-threading as well as potentially overclocking that CPU. Can you run games in multi-monitor across? Um, oh, okay. Yeah, Unbox Therapy is ready to go, but we're not quite ready for them just yet. So uh, I'm going to finish this blitz. There you go. Uh, you guys really need to look at the camera more rather than talking just to yourselves. Thank you, Mohammed, for the feedback. Um, there's only so much we can do. Someone asks after party. Yes, there will be an after party. I made a video about the ASUS 4K display. They used I AMD Affinity for merging two halves of the display. Oh, PC Per made a video about it. Cool. Going live in about 10 minutes. Come say hi. Oh, thanks for tweeting that, Lou. Um, you know what? Let's go back and let's see what some of the... Oh, the Apple TV got moved. Any air water coolers that would be good for overclocking a 3570K, something like an H100i would be a great choice. Yeah. Yeah. On the air cooling side, um, I love the Silver Arrow, NHD14. These are all high-end solutions. You yeah. could also pick up a Hyper 2 12 Plus. That's like, like the masses. Uh, 12K setup. How will the GPU keep up with this? It'll be quite difficult. We need more GPU power. Apparently, we're on the front page of Twitch. That's outstanding. It's awesome. Should I get, you should get neither of those things. They are both wastes of money. Oh, Just horrible. outright wastes of money. Oh, you, you know what? We should do a video on like just how utterly asinine it is to buy a low-end graphics card. We'd have to get one. We'll just buy it. 
They only cost like twenty dollars, so who cares? <laughs> really, I've never even looked. I know, no. They're... I've actually never looked at the price of like a... like the uh... price to performance ratio of these cards is just broken. It's just horrible. <laughs> Don't even bother. Slick, have you played Skyrim Legendary Edition? Yep. And have you gotten into the closed beta? Even if I right was, along. that would be under NDA. Even if I was, uh, I farted on the laptop and a little bit of smoke came out of it. Uh, okay. All right, so let's go ahead and have Lou join us then at this point, because apparently things have gotten a little bit silly. So I'm going to go ahead and add a media file where we have... Uh... Oh, Diesel didn't put it in the this folder, but it's okay, because I got this. I got this. I got this. Lou Unbox Therapy. Bam! There's a portrait. There's the guy who will be joining us right about... Now, hey Lou, how are you? He will be connected in a second. He'll be connected in a second. Yep. Oh, all right. He's got to turn on his mic. So Lou apologizes in advance for his microphone. It's apparently not that great. I haven't heard it yet, but it's not it's, that bad, it's right? It's not terrible, but it's. It, so Lou apologizes in oh, advance. Oh, Lou, for you're going to want to mute the stream over there. Not that great. I haven't heard it yet. But how about now? How about now? Am I there yet? You are here. All right, there we go. Anybody so, there? jumping down. Sorry? Hello, hello, hello. There you are go. live. Check, then we check, can check, turn one, him two. up. Yeah, we can turn him up a little bit, I think. All right, so you are our very second special guest, and uh, we are extremely excited to have you join us. Do you want to take just a brief moment? And uh, sort of introduce yourself to the oh, audience, no. those you of you who aren't familiar. I can't hear you. Um, let me see. There's something going on here. You can't hear us, apparently. Oh, okay. Right okay. Now, well, in that I case, hear you guys. I'll say a little bit about what... Uh... Oh, hold on. I wonder if it's our fault. Still Mr. pretty Tessa. quiet. I can't hear anything. Uh... I, I was can just do. using this. Just using it? Okay. Yeah, and it shows, if it shows a light there, it means uh, it's picking uh, up I voices. I can't hear you guys. I don't know if you can hear me or not. Uh, oh, hold on. Let's, uh, let's hit Maybe him on the chat. Should I try and jump out and jump back? I got here? it, I got it. You can hear me, but I can't hear you. Yeah, I think our audience can hear you. <laughs> okay, okay, Lou's going to try reconnecting. So I'm going to give you guys a little bit of a brief history of Unbox Therapy. So Unbox Therapy is a channel that, as you may or may not have hello, deduced hello, at this point, okay. is centered around the, the concept of perfect. unboxing as a way to clearly now. demonstrate a product and, and to really know. give people that hands-on experience. I know you, yes, you can hear me, but um, when we tested it earlier, I heard you uh, loud and clear. Now nothing. I could just see the chat. Hmm. hmm. Okay, well, here we go. Wait, what's that? This is also your... Okay, so if you close that one, is it possible that'll address it? I guess it's possible. It shouldn't really, but... Okay, I'm going to turn it off and start it again. Lou, can you hear me? Oh, boy. Hmm... Well, we're having one of those moments here, guys. We are going to try... No, I just checked that. We did test this before the show, so... Uh, it worked totally fine. <laughs> worked 100% correctly. Oh, I, don't think, I don't think it's my end, only because I didn't change anything. I literally let this thing sit here prior to uh, the stream, and I was talking earlier when we did the test run. All right. I think, I don't know why I can't hear you guys, though. So. Okay, we're going to relaunch comms, okay. and we'll be you back in just a moment. You want me to just sit tight and leave it the way it is? Okay, there we go. Let's try this one more time. So I've had a bit of a monkey wrench thrown in my whole introduction of Lou. <gasps> oh, monkey wrenches. I love Do you monkey wanna... wrenches. Uh, it's hard to do a topic in the meantime if we're trying to get audio running here. Uh, that is a good point, although I can do a other random topic. Sure, go for it. Give me one quick second to jump onto something here. 
that was a community item, so we have to find something that isn't because I can't link to the screen. That's going to be interesting. Uh, there's a Kickstarter project that got destroyed, basically. Ooh, I wanted to talk about this with Lou. <laughs> okay, okay. I was a little bit worried there for a minute, but uh, the wonders of technology pretty much came, um, came through. <laughs> All right, so I guess I don't have to uh, stumble through an introduction to do for the audience. Why don't you go ahead and tell us about Unbox Therapy and yourself and how you got going on this whole thing. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, right, a little bit of background. I I guess I, I think I started by accident. Um, I, I just uh, wanted to make the same kind of videos, I guess, that Oh, is, is am I too quiet? Oh, what? Who's quiet? Everything is quiet. What? Oh my God. Everything is silent. I, I can hear you guys. I can hear you guys perfectly, but I don't think anybody can hear anyone else. Oh, oh boy. Okay, can the stream hear us now? Everyone said they can just hear Lou, and apparently Lou broke the uh, the entire internet. So um, hold on a second. Let's go ahead and try try something here. Oh boy. You gotta tell him to come over. That's right. <laughs> wow. We are we are not. Oh, it's Windows. Boom. Oh Hello? my God. Hey. Okay. Is, does it work now? Are we good? No, I don't think so. Oh, yes. We're Boom. good. Boom. It was Windows. Blaming me. Well, could have been your fault. No. Nope. As easily as anything else. <laughs> it was. <laughs> All right. So, Lou, yes. tell us about Unbox Therapy. Tell us right. how you got started on this stuff, and hopefully they can actually hear you this time. Right, I, I see some comments saying Lou, Lou is fine, so I guess they can hear me. Um, yeah, we're good now. What's up, everybody? Thank you for having me on uh, the show today, first of all. I want to get that out of the way. And, uh, yeah, to answer your question, I've been doing this for about two and a half years, I think. And uh, in the beginning, it was pretty it, – it was amateur hour, and we've sort of slowly improved the operation – uh, and, and added a little bit of production value and had, had a couple of different people working on it. And uh, I guess our approach since, since the beginning was to sort of uh, add some cinematic value to the process of making tech videos or making product-based videos. So when did you feel like it really exploded for you? I mean, I know that already because I've been keeeping a very close eye on you since you had around one-tenth the number of subscribers <laughs> you have now. By the way, congratulations. You broke 500,000, I believe, today. Uh, yeah, I think so. yeah, either today or yesterday. Um, yeah, pretty crazy. It's, it's a lot of people. But, um, yeah, I think uh, for me it probably picked up somewhere, I want to say, like, maybe a year and a half in or something like that where I realized that this was a real thing that – people were doing professionally and uh, I guess I, I, I started to put a different level of focus onto it and to be honest with you like I, I mean I love doing it at, at this point in time I really couldn't imagine you know having a regular day job or something like that this is uh, it, it really I mean it gets cliche because a lot of people say it but it's it's one of the best things to do as, as you know I, I really do. We're, uh, we're both in very unique positions where, where we have these huge established audiences and it gives the flexibility to try things and to experiment and to start to have some fun with it. Now, I wanted to talk to you about this before we really dive into some of our regular WAN show topics. I get asked this all the time and I have my sort of standard response that I usually say, but people ask me, how do I get started on this? Right. 
Yeah, I know. It's uh, <laughs> you could have an you could have an inbox full of those questions on a daily basis. And I was on a, actually on a broadcast yesterday, and we sort of covered a similar topic because, uh, you know, honestly, when I started out, I didn't, I never, I don't think I reached out to anyone with that particular question. And part of that had to do, <laughs> I, I guess, part of that had to do with me making some assumptions, maybe some educated assumptions that that this having having success in this particular arena being such a new one was going to require some ingenuity and some trial and error and all of those things and so when people ask me for a set of guidelines i mean there are way too many variables at play for me to give you a playbook on how to get viewers on youtube or how to have success or how to add subscribers because at the end of the day you're making a piece of entertainment and what people find uh, entertaining or what people are drawn towards is relatively subjective how do you know before getting into it whether or not you're entertaining or whether or not people give a shit about what you're saying i mean you just don't know until you try <laughs> absolutely i think that's a very good point and the 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 funny thing about that is that was one of the things that made me notice you and what you were doing because up until then, as far as tech unboxings went, there was only a, maybe a handful of guys who were my size or bigger or even close. And what I noticed about the approach that you had was it was completely different from what anyone else was doing, where you were taking unboxing and you were putting your own spin on it. And I think a lot of people, I mean, a lot of people send me their gameplay videos or their uh, Let's Plays. Hey, Linus, can you check this out and give me your feedback? And I kind of look at it and I go, well, what have you done that's different? And I think right. that might be the solution. Right. I mean, it's never... It, it's never a bad idea to innovate. Uh, you know, you, you can't go the other way where you try so hard to do something unusual and it, it can be terrible too. So, <laughs> I mean, I mean, it, it 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 really requires some attention to detail and some attention to uh, the reaction of your viewers. I mean, you do have to listen. You do need to pay attention. If you can't answer every single comment or engage with every single user, you can at least read through some stuff and, and it sort of get an idea of what's working and what isn't working and and that really helps you to edit yourself because that's what that's one of the most difficult things to do uh, in this business when you're working in relatively small companies or even by yourself in the beginning is how do you how do you determine what to leave in and what to take out it's very difficult when when it's only yourself working on it absolutely and you know what I think this leads into one of our discussion topics really well small interaction versus big interaction so things like Twitter, Vine, Instagram versus Facebook, Google Plus, YouTube. How do right. you how do you feel that these things complement each other or compete with each other? You know, um, this is a, a this is a pretty interesting topic to me. Like I I'm, I have a, a pretty significant level of interest, at least I think so, in in social media and how it all. Uh, affects my business. I mean, I guess the same could be said for a lot of other businesses, but mine in particular. I think I think you could you can really notice a huge increase in your traction if if you can get a grip and get a handle on social media, um, especially with, with when we get into another topic that we're going to talk about today regarding the sub boxes on YouTube. But um, but <laughs> but but before we get there, it's like yeah, um, Facebook. I recently I recently switched my my regular human profile to one of what they call a brand page. And uh, after doing that, I noticed a couple of things that occurred. First of all, I was reaching fewer people, but uh, as, a, as a side effect of that, it, it, it meant that some things were modified in my account where I wasn't getting the same number of personal interactions in my inbox. Because for, for somebody who gets a lot of communication, an inbox, whether it be on YouTube or Facebook, is an incredibly terrible place to communicate. Uh, oh, it's because, horrible. Because what ends up happening is that you end up – uh, communicating with one individual with your answer nothing is public and as a result you end up answering the same thing a hundred different times and when you're when you're when you become uh, a, a you know a glorified uh, administration person you can't be making videos it's impossible to to handle both so i much prefer twitter from that standpoint because the conversations are generally public and mostly public and they're short and so they're short. when you have social interaction on a format like Twitter, 
uh, essentially the, the comments become, or the, the at messages become like headlines, like in a newspaper. And when you scan a newspaper, you can easily sort through what is the relevant information? What do I need to get back to? Um, you can triage the news essentially, and, you're, and, and the uh, communication that your audience has with you becomes news uh, versus this little thing off in private somewhere in an inbox that ha that is very difficult to triage, very difficult to quickly look at an inbox and say, this is important this is not important and and where, where can I start to work I mean I, I basically avoid inboxes at all costs now uh, Twitter Twitter is probably your best chance to get in touch with me and to get a response because at least I know if I respond to you other people can then go look at that response if they have the same question absolutely and I mean I think uh, one of the strengths of Twitter leading into our next discussion topic which is why is the YouTube subscription feed always broken yeah, um, I have heard I have heard some people, some other YouTubers that I communicate with, that have had contact with Google themselves, and I have heard that it is intentionally broken. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and and the theory behind that is similar to what's happening on Facebook right now, which is that people are inundated with content that as, uh, the power users are subscribed to so many channels that uh, it becomes difficult for YouTube to figure out what it is that they actually want to watch. And that's why I think they move to that activity feed or what to watch next on mobile devices. I think they think better than – they think they know better than you do as far as what you want to watch. And so they can use – Possibly, they could be using uh, previous viewership data to decide whether or not a subscription you have is something that you watch every single time and whether or not to feed that back into the sub box or to rec put a, some recommended video there or to, uh, you know, to leave it out. Uh, I think this is especially a problem when you produce a ton of content, especially like you guys do. Um, if you're putting up two, three, four videos in one day, it seems to me that the likelihood that that video is going to get lost and not reach the boxes becomes that much more likely. Absolutely. This is very true. And this is one of the reasons uh, for the longest time I completely ignored Twitter, Facebook, and all of that stuff. Because Partly because it didn't really matter to me because I was working at a retailer, I had my day job, YouTube was a side project for me. But also partly because, um, or not that, well that's why I ignored it. Um, right. And then the reason I started paying attention to it was because of needing to own the audience in a, in a way that goes beyond um, you know, Google's divine will For and sure. how they've decided that you should be allowed to interact. I mean, there's so many things on YouTube that you look at that are, look like they're broken on purpose. Things like <laughs> yeah, the subscription yeah. feed, things yeah. like the inbox. This is yep. the creator of Gmail and the That's conversation right. thread concept. Yep. Yep. YouTube has the worst inbox in the world. It's true. Yeah, I don't, don't, I don't, I mean, it really doesn't look like their intention is for people to enjoy using the, the inbox, the inbox right now. I mean, they could, they could completely get rid of the inbox and I'd be fine with it. Absolutely. Yeah. And there are I, other things that are exactly the same. Looking at, like, uh, they don't want you to have access directly to your audience. They want to control that. So things yeah. like how you used to be able to, back in the day, this is maybe before your time, but you used to be able to go through a list of every single one of your subscribers. That's true. Yeah, yeah, I recall such a thing. Gone. Yeah. They don't want you to know. As no, a user, I'm... sorry. As no, a user, one thing that annoys me is there's channels that I subscribe to. This actually happened to me a few days ago. I briefly mentioned it to you. Those channels that I subscribed to like a year or two ago because I watched their stuff and enjoyed it and then watched a random video by them recently went, oh, that's really cool. I should subscribe to these guys. Realized I was already subscribed to them and it went, that's interesting. I check YouTube almost every day and I've never seen one of their videos in my subscription feed. Right. Which is nuts. Because yeah, I think I think I don't think you're the only one who's had had an experience like that. I get messages on Twitter um, fairly regularly that that things aren't reaching the sub box, and and you end up figuring out that the ones who end up being that percentage that watch every single video, they're they're, they're your super fans. They're the ones who actually go out of their way to like visit the channel to verify yeah. yes. that they that they've seen everything. And and what what's worked out on the network 
in terms of the number of fans that fit into that category is about like 10 percent you know which is a which is pretty sad when you think about it because you would yeah. assume that clicking a subscription button is a fairly committal kind of thing it's like you know you're you're saying that you want to see more content so the idea that only 10 percent of people after the fact actually follow through on that seems pretty hard to believe I think for me, if I look at uh, the analytics numbers, because we can see where views come from. Yep. I think when I look at it, on the videos that do really well, where it's a hot topic, something like the Razer Blade 14 that we, un uh, that we launched a couple of days ago, yep. um, I'll get a, probably around 40,000 views from subscribers, right. which is exactly right there in that 10% yep. of yep. my total subscriber number, which is right. obviously a fabrication. <laughs> well, I, I mean... If you've got 400,000 users that share, uh, uh, you know, the same kind of uh, opinion and taste when it comes to content and entertainment, uh, subject matter, etc., you would assume that more than 10% would be interested in a razor blade unboxing. Like that is like right in line with the reason they subscribe. So I, I agree with you. There seems to be something else at play. Let's just hope it doesn't get to a point where we have to start paying to reach people like on Facebook. Well, what it started to feel like to me. Because I'm looking, because one of the one of the metrics I remember talking to you about this. Uh, we we ended up talking on the phone for like four hours or something stupid like that. This was back when I first met Lou, right. and I think the the conversation then was the metric that I look at for how strong a channel is is the new subscriber growth rate. How many new people click that button every single day? Right. And I've been looking at the numbers and I go, okay, every day. A thousand new people click the button for both you and me, sort of yep. that 800 to 1,000 range. Right. Why is it that when I release a video, the day after that thousand people click, maybe 10 of them or 100 of them actually <laughs> look at it? They yeah. just clicked. <laughs> Yeah, it is. I mean, it's 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 pretty complicated. I don't know. I, I assume that there's some elaborate kind of uh, algorithm there that, f that figures out how they're going to distribute this content. I know they're obsessed right now with viewer viewing sessions more so than they are with view counts in general. And they, they may think that they can recommend content to users that might increase their se session length and and that that's more important to their end game than it is for uh, the user to get what they think they want. I think Google, much like in a bunch of their other products, thinks that they know what we want more than we do. That's, and, and like, I can understand that from a certain degree, but not necessarily because there's certain types of content like Vice. I like watching Vice, but I'll sit down and watch a whole thing of Vice. But I don't yeah, want my same. entire subscription box to be Vice. Exactly. Other videos, I'll script through it to see what I want. I'll enjoy seeing more of those than the Vice videos, but it'll give me less because I'm skipping through it. Right. Whereas I might watch one or two Vice videos, but I watch the whole thing, so my whole feed is always just Vice. Yep. Yep. Oh, I mean, I see. Yeah, I mean, I think like the 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 Twitter model should 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 work just as well here i mean i don't click on every link that somebody posts but it doesn't mean that i don't want to see their tweets that's right I, and if i you, didn't want to see it well the unsubscribe or the unfollow button's right there yep yep 100 percent. i mean it, there are there are a million ways to do this that are user driven but google finds automated systems to be much more interesting so how do you feel as a content creator do you feel like you need to divest from the youtube platform um I don't think so. I mean, I think my goals have sort of changed as things as things have gone along. Uh, you know, I think uh, in in the beginning, I thought AdSense was the be all and end all. Like it would it would be sort of what we all relied upon. But uh, going forward, I realized that that real relationships, meeting people, uh, creating connections in the entertainment business and elsewhere, uh, have the potential to bring real value to what you're doing and to to you know, potentially give you access to resources that you never even realized you wanted. And, and uh, you know, for me, that means getting super creative. Like, I've, I guess I've always been a creative person, but I never imagined that at any point I'd be sitting around trying to come up with the next idea for some, some new video. But I think that YouTube for me, rather than be, uh, you know, my boss, like I originally looked at it, now it's just, um, it's an outlet. It happens to be the platform, the player, essentially, for, for what I'm doing, but 
I think that there are probably many different ways to create businesses around the idea of delivering video content online uh, that maybe aren't necessarily YouTube. I mean, I know a lot of networks, all the large networks, uh, the first thing they'll do when you sign with them is they will make sure that your content is places other than YouTube. I mean, they'll get it on Daily Motion and they'll get yeah. it on uh, Blip, Blip TV. I mean, they'll put anywhere they can put it, they will put it. And if the networks continue to grow and continue to gather as much steam and, and, and be as powerful as they are and as they will be, um, I could totally imagine them becoming their own conglomerate. I mean, the, the, the power that exists in networks now is, is uh, unbelievable. I never would have imagined that, that that was what was going to happen here. And it surprises me that YouTube let it happen. Um, yeah, yeah, I know. It, it, um, I mean, they're, they, they're, they're still doing it. They're still letting networks sprout up from everywhere. I, again, I think Google is one of those companies that – it's very difficult to figure out they play such a long game you know it's like it's like a chess match i, I have their their objective might be 10 steps down the road you never really know why they make the decisions they make and at first they might they, they look really strange and and like they won't work but i mean some of these some of those networks have have been sold recently revision three sold the discovery um uh, yeah. awesome awesomeness tv sold the dreamworks and we're talking deals in the tens of millions of dollars maybe google's goal in the short term is to bring some traditional hollywood money into the productions that are occurring on youtube and maybe they were prepared to do that at a, at a, at a relatively large cost we've we've actually covered that before yep. channels being backed by like he just said traditional hollywood money and it seems like it's going to happen another topic that we have in here is uh da, 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 possible discussion is is this why new media has a chance to swoop in and eat traditional media's lunch ah uh, yes i'd like to i'd like to play this for the audience this is uh this is kind of hilarious so hold on i'm just going to go ahead and full screen this and we're going to switch to my laptop here Oh, yay, touch screens. This Thursday on the season premiere of Long Island Landscapers. Let's do flamingos this one. Flamingos, elegant bird. This is Long Island, not Florida. We definitely don't know this time. The boys are going over the hedge. If we don't finish this job, we're not getting paid. And their bad attitude turns full bloom. You're allergic to the land. We do landscaping. Long Island Landscapers, Thursday night at 9 p.m. <laughs> so back to what i was saying that this is why we both share a view that big hollywood money might be coming into youtube because we need to get away from this trash and more towards stuff that's being produced for platforms like youtube and this is what allowed new media to come and basically start eating their lunch but now is this is this it then is the answer somewhere in the middle where obviously like obviously shows like breaking bad are going to exist you need high production values people have an appetite for high production values but they've also demonstrated they have an appetite for this like weird indie content that's like guys opening boxes or you know guys running around in sort of you know box armor hitting each other or whatever else it happens to be was the answer somewhere in the middle where we take that new media creativity and that old media money and is that what youtube will be in five years sure or even just a mix what do you think? Yeah. Dave? Yeah. I mean, uh, I think, I think it's, you're probably right. It'll probably end up somewhere in the middle. I think what will end up happening is guys like us, regular dudes who never intended to be where we are, will likely get access to resources that we never expected. And what the outcome of that is, it, it will be interesting to see. I don't think we're, that you or I is necessarily going to go out even with a budget and necessarily make breaking bad. But we might do things. <laughs> we, <laughs> but, but we, we might, could just start might, a meth lab. <laughs> but we, you know, we, we might do th we might do things that people uh, people enjoy and didn't didn't really know that they were were going to enjoy. I mean, I really think that the internet as a whole, from a media delivery uh, uh, perspective, has has really changed uh, pop culture 
in a big way. Like I don't know in the future how easy it's going to be to market something as, as popular to everyone when we've all become so sophisticated in our own specific niches, when we've decided, like, I mean, you guys are on here on your channel and on this stream, et cetera, talking about incredibly sophisticated things in a particular subject matter. That never could have happened on traditional media because you needed to find a message that was suitable for millions of people that you could you know, cheaply broadcast on a dumb pipe to millions of people all at once. Since that's not the case anymore, I think everything's gonna get more interesting. I think money in people's hands like you and I could produce some stuff that we never even knew we wanted. I think a great example is something like Video Game High School too where it was crowdfunded and actually i want to transition into some of our crowdfunding yeah. topics coming very soon so it was crowdfunded and it is exactly what we're talking about where it's the creativity of these and i'm not taking anything away from freddie wong but relatively amateur folks they had some <laughs> talent yeah uh, but let's face it come on their scripting is terrible the acting <laughs> is terrible comparatively right. It's really good for the platform it's on. Yes. And it's really good for what they're dealing with. But if they took the creativity, the mind that is Freddie Wong, and they gave him the money and the actors and the resources, maybe he's the kind of guy who can take that and really find that middle ground. And maybe Video Game High School Season 6 or whatever his next major project is, is that thing. Freddie Wong's going to yeah. be huge. Freddie Wong is huge. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's an important thing to remember, I think, is that you know, the, the, the more opportunities that a content creator has to sort of hone their craft, the better the stuff becomes. If you look at our, our early videos are, are likely terrible. Um, I mean, I'll speak for myself. I'm not going to speak for you. Oh, mine but... are worse than yours. <laughs> so, you know, and, and, and as time goes on and as you produce more content, that changes. And I think, it, I think, of course, it'll be exactly the same for people like him that are working with larger budgets. So let's talk crowdfunding for a little bit. We actually have a few things on the uh, on the stream. Or wait, no, I want to hear what you think of Chromecast first. Your hands on with one, right? Yep. Um, I've been I've been playing with the Chromecast uh, since uh, yesterday. I first ch tested it out, and then we've been messing around with it a little bit today as well. Um, I mean, it's thirty five bucks. It's crazy. Like I. I remember as a kid sitting around thinking it would be amazing to broadcast wirelessly what's on my computer onto my flat panel onto my bigger TV. And the, the fact that we can do that now in HD with a device that, that is like the size of a USB key is, um, is pretty damn impressive. And so um, from a technical standpoint, it works exactly as they say it's going to work. I mean, you can broad, you broadcast a tab from your Chrome browser. You install a, uh, a little extension. It takes a couple of seconds finds it automatically and then uh in you in the youtube app on your mobile device as well you, you'll see a, a chromecast button and you can just immediately move anything you're watching from the couch up onto the up onto the flat panel and what i said in my video was the reason that, that this is so interesting to me is because the, so far the youtube experience from the couch is terrible like on every device uh yeah. you know whether it's a, a game console or the apple tv or whatever like um, searching for a video, trying to have that sort of, sort of be a video DJ with a bunch of people sitting around has been a bad experience. And this really changes that in a, in a really big way. And it does so at a price point that a lot of people are going to be interested in. Now, I've been saying this since I saw the first smart TV. Smart TV was dead on arrival. Yeah. It, was, it never stood a chance. We already had things like Patriot Box Office and things like the Asus O player, WD Live, or My TV Live, or whatever they called that thing. We already had right. these things which were already better than the smart TV implementations that we have now, <laughs> all these years later. And now Google's coming along and saying, $35, don't worry about that smart TV, it's over. Yeah, no, no, I completely agree. I mean. It's amazing. You walk into a Best Buy or Future Shop or whatever, and you go through the TV aisle, and they want to charge a thousand dollars for for smart features, or at least five hundred. And <laughs> I mean, now they're going to have a little device sitting on the shelf next to it, and any sales guy with a head on his shoulders is going to say, "Listen, get the dumbest panel you can and plug this little HDMI device in, and you're going to be better off." Because, and I love how it's, it's Google, so. Anyone could have released this, and if it worked this well, been like, ah, 200 bucks, 250 bucks. Yeah. Yep. And no one would have blinked an eye. They would have been like, that's a little bit expensive, but it's awesome, so everyone should buy it. 35 bucks? This is another example of their thinking 10 steps ahead. 
and yep. like Getting they're doing something completely bronkers and well, it was let's definitely, find out I don't, going. yeah it's definitely a lost leader um for the first bunch of sales they were including three months of netflix which brought the actual which brought the actual cost of the device to eleven dollars they i think they took that off yeah it's yeah. gone now. no no they, yeah. they they did they, they they sold out of that particular promo but going into it i mean it, this is a classic Google situation where they completely either either they do it intentionally or they underestimate the demand for their products and it becomes a shit show. It's it's, it's one or the it's what it's one or the other. I'm not sure. I mean, I haven't figured it out yet. I think I think that they suck at retail to be honest with you. <laughs> so just make everything free and just figure out how to deal with yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, the, the funny thing was like a bunch of people a bunch of people rushed to order it on the Google Play Store, right? And they they had a five day lead time from those purchases, and then forty five minutes later, Amazon launched and it was available for next day delivery. And so all these like enthusiasts who were sitting around waiting to click their mouse button on the Google Play Store got screwed, and guys like me ended up with it the next day. <laughs> <laughs> well, awesome. I I'm, I I missed out on it entirely. So I've uh, found someone on Twitter who who follows me who ordered two right away. So I'm gonna buy one of them off him, and I'll, hopefully I'll get to play nice. with it pretty soon. Yeah, you won't you won't regret it. I mean, it's it's a it's a stupid easy device to take with you. I can see carrying this thing um, into boardrooms, uh, into hotel rooms. Hotel I mean, rooms, it, yep. It's it's crazy. It's 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 really convenient. So crowdfunding, I wanted to talk about a couple of things. So number one is ah yes, have you heard about the crowdfunded Ubuntu Android phone? It, is it actually funded though? It's, Not yet. Yeah, they're working on it, but they want an enormous amount. They want an enormous amount of money though. Thirty-five yes. million. They want to break every record from every crowd crowdfunding project ever. They want thirty-two million 32. by August twenty-first. Yeah. Um... What are the odds? <laughs> uh... <laughs> yeah. I just, I, I honestly, I don't, I don't know. I know I'm, I'm probably gonna catch heat for this, especially from your audience. But do it. I mean, the what makes great phones, what makes great consumer devices, is mass appeal, is scale. You know, when they, when, when you have enough users that are out there in the public using them, it means you're gonna have a better ecosystem of developers working on those devices. I just don't see the value proposition of having this, this device you know, in the far corner of the room that you and 10 other people have. Um, this, I don't see how that can be all that compelling. This is not the only phone they're releasing, though. This is just the super premium, but, yeah. ridiculous I, wh one. What I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, are they launching a legitimate competitor to what's already out there? Or is this, is this something that's going to be for enthusiasts? And it's a very good question, because you look at something like BlackBerry 10, it was reviewed reasonably well. In fact, you had said you felt that there was a place for it, Slick, um, in the market. However, when's the last time you saw a Z10 or a Q10 in someone's hand? And it's not a matter of is it a good platform, because I think we can all agree that it's good. But the problem is, will you tear my Android device away from me, or someone else's iOS device away from them with this? One thing that I have to input on this is BlackBerry had side loading apps. This runs an entire Android operating system, and its switching is fast, as far as I've heard. Even so... an Android phone, though. Okay, like a, a poorly supported Android device, there will be apps all over the Play Store that don't work right with it. This is a thing that exists now. <laughs> Never mind if you plan to make only, what do they plan to make, 40,000 of them? I think that was it. I don't know. That sounds yeah. about right. 40,000 units is the planned run, and they will cost around 800 and something dollars each. Uh, the first few that got in got them for 600. Yeah, it's 830 dollars now. Uh, one of the other things that seems a little bit crazy to me is what they're committing right now. They're committing, um, I believe it was a sapphire screen, uh, dual 4G, so it's like a world 4G phone. They're committing 128 gigs of storage. They're committing an um, undisclosed processor four and a half inch screen all these things except the ship date is going to be i believe it was april 2014. <laughs> it, yeah it I, I mean i i tend to think like i i i personally think this thing's going to be a disaster myself i if it does end up reaching it i i just don't think that a crowdsourced phone is what we all need right now i i 
there have been crappy enough crowdsourced products that have come out that aren't <laughs> that aren't nearly as um, uh, that aren't nearly as enthusiastic as trying to develop a phone using crowd money. I mean, that's just an incredibly hard thing to do. One thing is it it is canonical. So they're a company that's been around for an incredibly large period of time. But their they've software not, they already haven't works. done hardware. Their software already works, and they're getting other people to do the hardware. Look at even someone like Samsung. They are now the world's most profitable consumer electronics company, above Apple. You look at they their are. first iteration of anything, it's terrible. Their first TVs, terrible. Their first optical drives, terrible. Their first phones, terrible. Their first friggin' appliances were terrible. All terrible. This is going to be Canonical's first attempt at a super premium high-end phone. And they're only, they're only spending a maximum of $32 million on something that I can tell you right now. Samsung is spending a lot more than that. An order of magnitude or two more than that. Yeah. Well, Samsung spends more money on marketing than the market cap for HTC and Motorola combined. Any, any of that, all, you, you could add up all the Android competitors and Samsung spends more on marketing alone than their net value. So, I mean, it's, this is, this is, uh, th there's a terrible situation out there right now for Android phone makers who aren't Samsung in general, let alone a new player who wants to come along and compete in the space. HTC, they're flat. I mean, they're, they're barely making any money. And they make beautiful hardware. What another? I'm gonna. I'm just continuing to battle both of you. Go ahead. Um, another thing is this again is not their only phone. Yes. So they okay. are pulling in. This is funding to make sure that they can sell enough of them. Because if they can't sell enough of them, they're not going to bother release it. This isn't the only funding that's going into this phone. They're pulling in funding from other parts of their company. They're a massive company and they yes. always do this. One thing that this phone is doing is closing in ecosystems. So you can plug it in and it will dock and turn it into a whole Ubuntu OS as you plug it into your computer. So they want to bring together an ecosystem. They want to do this with all their phones and they're going to pull in funding from all over the place to help this because if you watch the video, they want this to be their supercar, basically so that they can trickle down and then eventually release a phone like this, which is no longer a trickle down, and then have another one of these. So is the market ready for this yet? Because CES two, three years ago, I was already watching super phones being plugged into laptop shells that turned them into Android OSs on a... Not a laptop shell, though. You're supposed it doesn't to plug matter. it directly into a monitor. Plug it into whatever you want. Are we ready yet for a phone that is more than a phone, and will people care? I don't know if people will care, but it doesn't matter. What I'm trying to say is that they're getting funding from other parts of their company. Oh, and that much is true. Because they're trying to close up an ecosystem. But my point with Samsung was that it doesn't matter how much funding they're pulling from whatever part of their company, because they're not as big as Samsung, and Samsung's first attempt at anything usually sucks. Yeah. So I'm saying it might suck. Unless yeah. they're better than Samsung at hardware. <laughs> I don't know, man. <laughs> I'm pretty sure, I, I don't remember where I read this, but I'm pretty sure they're pulling in other influences for the hardware. There's no doubt, I mean, that this is a super ambitious thing. I mean, and I don't, you know, I don't mind. It doesn't bother me. Like, I think anybody out there trying to, to innovate and create something, you know, is, is, a, is, is a positive thing. It's going to push the entire, the entire uh, market forward. But at the same time, if, if I was a betting man, like if you were asking me to invest in it, I mean, that's a different, that's a completely different story. I didn't. Yep. There's no way I'm then investing in a piece of hardware that comes out nine months from now. I didn't. I'm, I'm, I'm excited for it. I want to see where it's going. I did not buy it. And I looked at it fast enough that I could have bought it at the cheapest bracket. And I didn't. Right. So to throw that into the pie, I'm excited for the next time they do this. In the video, they said that they, if this works, they want to do it annually almost. Okay. So if they do this next year and it's super successful this year, then maybe I will because that would be awesome. But I want to see it happen first. So, moving on to our next uh, crowdsourcing topic, uh, what happens when these things fail? So, the Dune that came to Atlantic City by the Forking Path Co. Ahem, this is not an easy update to write. The short version, the project is over, the game is cancelled, and there's a bunch of angry comments from backers, so these are backers only. The problem is we weren't kept in the loop. We've been giving false information. The problem is that you know, why did we pay for him to move? Why did we pay for these things? Why was there this ambitious goal with, you know, like a $35,000 or why was there this ambitious project that had a $35,000 goal that 
clearly isn't enough money to do anything. And, you know, maybe this isn't even the worst case scenario. I mean, Lou, you were talking about Kickstarter or Indiegogo or crowdfunded projects that maybe they actually make it to market, but they totally suck. How much mm -hmm. faith are you putting into this stuff? Uh, um, I mean, for, for me, I don't put very much. Uh, you know, there's, there's. I think that a lot of the products that, that have come out of it have proven to be less than what people expected. And in the case of probably the largest product to date, which was the, the, uh, the watch, the Pebble watch, they, they even did something strange, which was move units to Best Buy prior to fulfilling the people who paid in advance. Uh, there, there are no rules. You know, when you send your money, you're not guaranteed anything and you're essentially enabling a group of people who you don't know to go out and decide how they want to spend that and when they want to deliver something back to you for that for that investment i mean i think that i think crowdfunding could really go to the next level when you actually can get a, you can actually invest in a company you can actually get a piece of the action like that that to me gets a lot more interesting you know when when you can say i really believe in this to the point where i want to invest in it anywhere else in the real world when a person makes an investment in a company they expect something back in terms of equity you don't just expect to be pre-ordering something it, it, it's amazing how just a little bit of hype can drive people to pay for something that doesn't exist and may never exist and that's exactly it, is right now, I've seen good ideas crowdfunded that didn't make it because they did not have a slick video, or they didn't have a great presentation, or the models showcasing the prototype were ugly, or whatever other infinite number of reasons that a good idea can fail. And I've seen stupid ideas that are meeting their targets, even though, like, you know... I sort of I sort of hate to call these guys out, but it's a it's a phone case that has um, earbuds that like retract into it, and I'm just like, it, it beat its target, and I'm looking at this going like, are you friggin' serious? Like it's gonna be the crappiest earbuds in the world. We already know this because they don't know a bloody thing about <laughs> earbuds. It's going to be a cell phone case which shouldn't be worth more than about four dollars. And they, I think they wanted 30 bucks or 40 bucks for it or something stupid like that. Oh. Yeah, I, I think I think a lot I think a lot of people fall in love with with the concept and and when you when your product becomes a message and not an actual physical product when you boil a product down just to its just to its advertising components you realize that that's actually where the magic is like when yes. when when a company tries to convince you to buy buy something generally generally speaking you know, leading up to that actual purchase is when you're the most excited. Once you've actually got it, that excitement starts to, you know, uh, you know, mm -hmm. sort of, yeah, exactly plateaus. Or hopefully, if you like the product, it plateaus. It might even go down if it's not what you expected. But that's what they're doing. They're playing off that initial moment when you think, "Wow, that would be cool," and they're selling you something within that moment. So it, it's sort of, it's almost in a way like some new kind of advertising platform where where they're capitalizing at the point of advertisement instead of waiting for the production to take place. It's the Simpsons monorail episode all over again. Now you two have slammed it. I'm going to again come from the other side. At the same time, the whole thing about Kickstarter, if you read anything up about it and Indiegogo, the customer is supposed to read the article. A lot of times they don't. A lot of things have been released where they did not do the research. That's the customer's fault. And even though it's failed, that sucks. You're taking a gamble with your money. You're playing a game with your money. You're going, okay, this looks interesting. I want it. And I want to keep being oh, yeah. informed on it. And I want updates on it. I want to know everything that's going on about it. So you put money down for a segment of something. So you might get something back. You might get information only. You might get your name in the game. You might get your face in the game. You might get whatever. Say it's a game. It could be something else. You need to look into it and make sure, read up on the people, read up on the product, make sure it's going to work. A lot of the times, the only things I've, I've backed quite a few things on Kickstarter, a lot of the things I will only back them if they're mostly produced already. I don't want to back something if the guy's like, yeah, I have a CAD model of it and like it might work. That's pretty cool. I'm going to back something when he's like, yeah, this is my prototype. It works. Look, boom, boom. It's awesome. I just need to produce a bunch of them. I need money to get into manufacturing. That makes a lot more sense for me. When he goes, I've talked to these people. They've said that they can manufacture this many units at this price. I need this much money to make it happen. That's something I'm going to back. Right. I'm I've only backed one thing so far. 
Star Citizen. That was it. Yeah. And it was only because Chris Roberts has a long time tradition of success and he had a great idea and concept and he had enough footage, enough in-game gameplay that he was releasing yep. and showing that I was confident that it was worth dropping my money on. Big name, research yeah. done by the purchaser, all that kind of stuff. So Kickstarter is not bad. Yeah. Just don't use it poorly. No, no, no. I, I, I want to be clear too. It might come off like I'm bashing it. I absolutely love the idea of it. I think the idea of crowdfunding is fantastic. But I think that there's the potential here that if enough people get screwed, it can be that sort of one rotten apple situation where it can spoil the public perception about the entire platform. So it's important that they make it very clear how you're supposed to engage with it as an end user because if there's enough press about bad things occurring, then some things like this might not ha have the same traction in the future. And I don't want to see that happen because I like the idea of a producer being able to go and reach directly to the audience without nearly as many middlemen as were traditionally required. Tell I, me I, something, I'm a fan. Oh, okay, tell me something as a business owner. So I really liked your, your thought about somewhere in between private investment and going IPO, yeah, yeah. full blown. What about a crowd investment that's not an investment in the product because that's another one of the things I agree with you 100% that's absolutely ridiculous. I'm not giving my money up front so that I can have a spot in line. That's, that's absurd. I mean, it, it's illegal in the USA to charge, actually, this is kind of funny. It's illegal in the USA to charge someone's credit card for a back order before you ship it. That's right. And but yet, but can, and, they, can they not do a pre-authorization on it? Yes, they can yeah. do a pre-authorization. But if I'm giving you my money, I want something besides a spot in line. And yeah. is that potentially the future of this, where if Unbox Therapy, you know, LLC, or Linus Media Group Inc. decides to get investment, we could crowdfund investment in terms of an actual ownership in the company? Um, that that is currently illegal in the United States. I don't I don't know about Canada, uh, but there is talk that eventually things might might uh, end up going in that direction. But the tr the only the, the trouble I have there is that it's kind of like an amplification of the problems we already talked about. Where if the end user doesn't do their research and understand what they're getting involved in, it could bring a lot of heat onto the entire platform, and and it could it could end up being fairly destructive. So it would need you would need to have some kind of authentication system to determine if people were a good fit. I think that the the, the producer would have to look at each person's uh, submission and determine whether or not they wanted to work with that person and accept yeah. even if even if it's a tiny little stake, you would have to look at it and do uh, some some quick analysis to determine whether or not you wanted to accept that uh, bid. And that's actually a very good point because that's one of the reasons that Linus Media Group Inc. doesn't have any private investors. Uh, we had offers. We had people who wanted to throw some funding at us at the beginning um, in order for to have a stake in the company. And for me, it wasn't even a matter of do I mind giving up a stake because it's other than it being a phenomenal amount of paperwork, it's not really the end of the world. I still get to pay myself a salary, so you know I'll be fine. Um, and it wasn't necessarily a matter of basically the problem was do i want to work with this person and if you did a crowdfunded type of initiative like this you're working with so many people yes. and you have to answer to so many people yeah it's kind of yeah crazy. i did, uh, listen i di i did one before and it was not the most fun experience ever yeah your ultimate uh, yeah. ultimate gaming build yeah it's it, it's 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 a it's a really strange way to interact with people you've never met you know that's that's the bottom line it's like it, 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 you know ultimately people i mean i'm sure you've the whole keyboard warrior thing you know how this works when people have anonymity online yeah. and they're not a face and they're not a person that has to answer you know with a face attached to it all of a sudden what they're saying and how they're saying it changes drastically absolutely yeah. that's a really good point Okay, I think I had one more topic that I really wanted to discuss with Lou here before we, uh, before we said thank you very much for, for joining us. I'm just trying to see if I can find it here. Plastic iPhone. Oh yeah, the plastic iPhone. So I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to fire this up, and I'm going to just uh, let the viewers check out the video a little bit here if they sure. haven't already. Sure.
So guys, this is all considered speculation at this point in oh there's a pizza ad. I used to I used to be able to spin pizzas. Spin dough. I worked at a pizza shop. Good job. Hey guys, Mike here, the Detroit Borg, with a sneak peek of the new plastic iPhone. So this is just the back shell of the phone. Now, as you can see, it actually integrates all of the uh, chassis components as well. So we don't have our battery or the display or anything like that. We just have the chassis components, like the EM shield, the frame for the. Okay, that's that's basically the point. The video goes on for about six minutes, but. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know how much more there is to say about it than that. It's a little bit thicker than an iPhone 5. It's obviously going to be cheaper than an iPhone 5. How how many times has Steve Jobs spun in his grave at this point in the very short time that he's been passed away? My <laughs> my comment directly on the document was just how pissed would Jobs be? Because, <laughs> <ugh>. Yeah. <laughs> I I mean, well, the the three G was had a plastic back. Yes, but they moved beyond that, and I don't think Jobs ever believed in moving backwards. The original iMac was a plastic CRT. After that, did he ever go back to a plastic iMac? No. Yeah, I mean, pl plastic is... I mean, that's one of my, my most major criticisms of the, uh, of the S4. The S4, the, the, the texture of the plastic on the S4 is so slimy. It's, um, it, just does, it just doesn't have that same sort of feel it doesn't feel like a high quality material i mean these are these are going to be cheap these are going to be the first apple's first foray into the i suppose the budget market and have and, and they're definitely their first foray into having multiple devices available in the phone segment so um i think there's pretty much one reason they did it not not there's two reasons i guess there's the expense so they could sell them cheaper and second I, they're going to do colors and they've had incredible success in the past with the ipod lineup going you know having different colors for a different audience and I don't know I mean I personally don't care that much about colors but I guess there's probably a youthful audience out there that might even iPods were anodized metal later on in the product cycle or later yeah. on in the in the product development and yep. I mean the reason I think they're doing this is pure uh, dick measuring for lack of a better word you look at Samsung smartphone shipments versus Apple's iPhone shipments for Q2 Samsung sold about double what Apple does. Is that yeah, because but, they're selling a bajillion in one S4s? Okay, partially, yes. Yeah, they didn't. Apple hasn't launched a new phone. Yes. Right? Yeah. So Apple hasn't launched a new phone. And in addition to that, Apple doesn't have a low cost volume mover in order to maintain their dominance with the, with the App Store. If they want to keep having as many downloads as Google Play, which I don't think. Has Google passed them already? If not, it's very close. Yeah, I'm not sure. Total number I think, of downloads? I, yeah. That I, that I don't know. I think, I think that the App Store still has more Yeah, I think, I think for total of all time, I'm pretty sure they're But they have, a, they have a long head start, and I think they're not that far ahead anymore. Last time I looked at it. So there's two things here. So number one is I think Apple is afraid in that measuring contest, that is how many units of phones are you selling. And right. number two is I think they want to maintain iOS as the premier development mobile platform for developers to really be attracted to um, and I wonder if either of those are the right approach because you look at what brought about the success of OS 10 and it wasn't Apple being afraid of having six percent market share they were content to have six percent market share but they did what they believed was right whether it was right or not is a whole yeah. other conversation, yeah. but they did what they believed, and it looks like that's turning around now with the iPhone, where instead of doing what they believe is right and what they believe is correct, they're doing what investors are demanding or what, you know, yahoos that email them are telling them that they think they should do. I don't think Cook has the balls. They're going for those happy metrics instead of what is really deep down what they should be going for because of exactly what you just said, which I don't necessarily feel like repeating. Uh, but I, I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah. They've, they've been making mass market decisions for a while now. I mean, you, you can look at some of their decisions with the pro lineup. I mean, they didn't update the Mac pro for well years now, maybe five years. That was terrible. You know, and, and they, um, you know, they've going, been going with more embedded solutions where systems aren't as upgradable as they once were. Um, you know, one of the most major consumer decisions they made was to put their stores in malls where, if anybody does any research on malls, you know that like eight out of 10 people at any given time in a mall are females. Um, I, I remember, I remember, I'm not trying to be sexist or anything, but 
generally speaking, enthusiasts are males. Um, if you look at your analytics of your channel, you'd know that. But, um, but anyway, yeah, it, it's, it's, they've made, been making decisions the whole way that have been mass market decisions where they want to reach consumers who they don't care if they were previously their consumers. They're always targeting uh, new users, even though their loyalty numbers have traditionally been been incredible. But one of the things just regarding development that still remains to be um, that they're that where their dominance is, is in getting people to pay for apps. Yeah, because because on the Android side, as many downloads as are going on, and as, as many developers are focusing in that area, you'll see an app that costs $4 on iOS, and the developer has to give it away for free with ads on on the Android side, because the user base has a different mentality regarding uh, you know, the, pur the purchasing of an app, um, the app store it cl claims to have uh, the largest database of credit cards of any e-commerce site uh, next to next to Amazon. So now tell me this, will a cheap phone turn that around? Will it will we be attracting more cheapskates to the iOS platform who aren't willing to pay for an app? Because um, it was actually I, I was taught I was on a message board for an app that I absolutely love air video It's awesome. It's iOS only because the developer basically came out and said in this thread uh, We don't give any cares about Android because we're not convinced any of those users will give us any money Whereas we have a very healthy business supporting iOS developing this iOS app that we believe is the best in the market, and it really is. It's so much better than anything else. It's smooth, it's perfect. Um, and we're gonna stick with that because this is the horse that got us here. Do you think that cr creating a cheapo iPhone or like a, a value iPhone will erode that premium mentality that an, that an iOS user has and that willingness to pay? Um. I mean, there's there's obviously the potential for it, but it's hard to imagine that an end user would walk home with a new iOS device. I mean, even if that's an iPod Touch for that matter, and not launch into the App Store and see what's hot on the charts. I mean, that's just the next thing that you do. I see kids who have iOS devices and their parents' credit cards are hooked up to them because it's it's a pay-to-play type ecosystem. You know, we've had a lot of problems like that. Recently, there was, there oh, was really? that mom who had like a six thousand dollar charge on a credit yeah, card. Yeah, because of the in in app purchases. Yeah, it was yeah. a kids game, and yeah. they kind of shrouded that they were really purchases to yeah. make them like an adult would be like, okay, this is a purchase, but it was slightly shrouded, and it wasn't a big complicated process to buy something. So the kids just do 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 do, do whatever. Yeah, yeah, and there's like a class action, I think, on that particular yeah. app against that particular app. But yeah, it's there. You you boot into the iOS ecosystem, and you realize pretty quickly that if you're going to participate in any meaningful way, you need to connect a credit card, and that just doesn't happen when you boot into the Google Play Store. Yep. You know. So whether the device is cheaper or not, if you want to utilize it, you, you kind of, that's just the approach they've taken. All right. Well, that's, uh, that's a very interesting take on it. And I don't, I don't disagree, actually. Yeah. I guess we'll have to see what happens because the reality of it is iPhone 4 has been available as a value option for $0 with contract, at least here in Canada, for a while. Yeah, and, and, they've, and they've continued to sell a ton of them. Still a great phone. I'm... You know, I, I love the HTC One, but I, if I had to go back to using my iPhone 4 today, I wouldn't die. I'd be fine. No, We're... and yeah, and there are, there are certain things that you, I mean, on, on both sides, on both platforms that each one does better than the other. It's just, it's not a very clear argument, that particular one. It's what, I, I hate getting into that argument probably more than any other, and I probably run into it more than any other, the whole iPhone versus Android. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, do you want to do a quick plug for your channel before you go? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm available uh, at Unbox Therapy on Twitter or YouTube.com slash Unbox Therapy. And uh, yeah, I make videos about consumer products and talk about consumer products. And so if you want to check out more, then that's the place to do it. Or you can anyone just... who thinks we're competitors, guys, that is uh, totally ridiculous. We even cover the same products sometimes, but it's a very different style from what we do here. Yeah, for sure. No, we're, we're all cool. I mean, um, it's really, I think it's really valuable to connect with people of like mind in this, in this space just because it's so new and moving so quickly that um, ha having success depends on it.
All right. Thanks so much, Lou. I really appreciate you joining us, and thank you very, very much for joining. All right. I think he's gone. So, guys, remember, our live guests every week are brought to you by Razor Comms. Go ahead and click the link that I'm leaning down here next to. Uh, oh, oh, I went and moved XSplit. Got no idea where the link is. Right there, that link, if you want to, whoop, right there. If you want to try Razor Comms for yourself, remember, guys, if you use this particular Bitly link, it helps us out a great deal. Just before we jump into the Twitter Blitz, um, because I'm assuming that... Yeah, we're going to do a this. Twitter Blitz. So, guys, hit us on Twitter right now. I wanted to jump onto our seemingly weekly... EA news. Oh, I know, right? Poor EA. Here, let me bring let me bring this up because it's just like it's terrible as usual. <laughs> it's uh. Find it. Yeah, is this is this the one? Oh no, there yeah, there go. we go. Boom. Oh EA. I don't even like the the thing is everything that we talk about is newsworthy. I know. It just right? happens to always be them. So the original Madden programmer wins 11 million in a lawsuit against EA, and the worst part is, oh, EA, uh, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Brutal. Oh, EA. So basically, he developed Madden for MS-DOS, Commodore, Apple II like a long time ago and has an agreement with them where they have to pay him royalties for every release on derivative works which basically amounts to anything with madden in the title yeah and they've been releasing madden games for well since then yeah so and as far as i know they haven't ever paid out i don't think they have ever paid out I, I don't know why he waited so long, but as of now, they owe him a lot of money. So basically, the court's ruling... Um, <clears throat> so hold on. So the $11 million has been awarded for games it looks like prior to 1996. The court's ruling also gives Antonik the ability to pursue the same claims against EA for games released after 1996, where revenues exceed $3 billion. <laughs> so maybe that is the answer. Maybe the trick is find your an employer who's stupid enough to sign a royalty deal, build something for them with a clause about derivative works. I mean, honestly, the fact that EA signed anything to do with royalties for derivative works they, is insane. They probably forgot. This was so long ago. Like... So incredibly long ago. They probably just forgot. The fact that anyone at EA was ever stupid enough to sign anything like royalties for derivative works is just that's not that surprising oh come on now they made SimCity online only <sighs> okay <laughs> but i mean at least there's a rationale there i mean maybe the rationale one, for him yeah. was that they didn't want to pay him very much money um so they just, just kind of signed whatever they did I mean, some of the best movie deals have been on ones where the film wasn't expected to do very well. So the, you know, principal actor says, okay, well, just give me 1% of the revenue. And it's like, yay, paycheck. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think he doesn't have to work anymore at any rate. Yeah, no. Although if he developed it for DOS, Commodore, and Apple II, he might be around the not working anymore range already. Yeah, but now he gets to not work and sit on a boat, sort of like... High-class baller. Yeah, with like a pool full of ladies that are just there because, you know, they could hang out there because it's a nice boat. <laughs> All right, so let's go... Oh my gosh, 84 new interactions on Twitter. And uh, let's go ahead and hit that. Would you rather buy a 3770K or a 3820? Uh, I'd probably go 3770K. How about you? Why 3820? I don't know. Probably 3770K. Do you need 64 gigs of RAM? No. Okay. Uh, what are yours and Slick's opinions on the Cooler Master Quick Fire TK? Any alternatives at the same price point that you like? So the TK is, I believe, the uh, the sort of 10 keyless one, if I recall correctly. TK stands for yeah. 10 keyless. So there is the... Oh, wait, hold on. Which one's the one that has the arrow keys integrated into the number pad? I don't remember exactly what it's called, but I'm pretty sure that one's just the 10 keyless. Oh, okay. In that case, it's fine. It's Cooler Master Mechanical Keyboard. It's a... Oh, I don't remember the name of it. 
Uh, your opinion on the Razer Hammerheads? Uh, I haven't tried them yet. Mine actually arrived in the mail like two, three days ago. So it's much to my embarrassment that I haven't had a chance to try them yet, but I'm extremely stoked to check them out. And uh, I've heard that they're quite bassy, so I can already say that I, they're probably not my favorite thing in the world. But my understanding is for $49.99, they're actually not bad. The, uh, the overview on a Nantech was pretty positive. Cool. Do you, re do you recommend Cherry MX Red Switches? Not really. Some people do like them. Uh, David Fitzpatrick, have you ever considered delitting a processor? I was actually the first one to ever delit an X6800 Extreme Edition. So there you go. Yes, I have. <laughs> I don't really recommend it, though. And no, I haven't, because I don't... Yeah, whatever. I haven't used the Audio Engine A5 Plus speakers, unfortunately. That's, that's one of the problems, especially with audio equipment. It's like recommending it before you've tried it is kind of sketchy. Yeah, it's better to just not. I've heard great things about it. It's one of those things I've heard of, but... Mm. Apple equals new EA? No. Nothing Apple does is as stupid as anything that EA does. <laughs> I don't like Apple. I would not say that. Yeah, exactly. You know what? Speaking of Apple, our, our story... You know what? We're going to come back to Twitter Blitz after, because I wanted to get into Samsung being the largest... Ooh. Most consumer profitable. or most profitable consumer electronics company now. So where did that go? It's somewhere. There was three of it, I think, at one point in time. Did we all? Oh, here it is. Did we all put it in the dock? Yeah. So nice. I had to try and clean it up. That dock was incredibly messy. Actually. All right. So there you go. Yahoo News. In the second calendar quarter of this year, Samsung stole Apple's long-standing title with quarterly profit of eight point three billion compared to Apple's 6.9 billion. So that, that is news and that's fascinating. So 71 million units of smartphones compared to Apple's 31 million. But what I want to launch into with this is are we really gonna start calling Apple a new EA when they're making 6.9 billion in a quarter? I mean, this is where that mentality that if a business isn't growing exponentially, you know, like that, uh, that curve or that, or that hockey stick, if a business isn't doing that, then it's a failure. Apple is not a failure yet. They are a long way away from being a failure. They made $6.9 billion selling half as many units of smartphones as Samsung. Their business is extremely profitable and extremely lucrative, and they have cash, cash, cash to develop whatever new concept, as long as someone shows up over there with the vision to make it happen, that they want to. And, like, it's going to take so long to, for them to fall, if they do fall. Yes. Like, it will take an incredibly long amount of time because their coffers are huge. Yes. They have so much money, it's insane. And they still will have a cult-like following of people somewhere that will continue to buy their products, so they will continue to exist, even if they're much smaller and much more niche. Remember, they've done this before. Yep. They've become niche. And by becoming niche, they have blown up. Yes. Because that happens sometimes. As you'll see, they become niche, and then all the professional people start using them, and then they blow up. They could do that again. And if at some point they figure out how to appease their professional users again, that would be a very... So, Tim Cook, if you're watching right now, appease your professional users because they advocate for you. They're dropping off. Uh, like I mentioned last week, Freddie Wong released a big thing about how he's moving to PC. Yep. Everything. Well, Final, Final Cut's a disaster now. People are moving over to Adobe, and Premiere ain't perfect, no. but... Final Cut's a total disaster, and Adobe has figured out how to get people to pay for Creative Cloud. Holy crap. We're paying for Creative Cloud. They've kind of gone, okay, let's tie together enough value-add services. We are going to make this a package. Yep. In much the same way that Office revolutionized word processing and you know, PowerPoint and Excel. See, you hardly, I can hardly even remember what those programs are called if I don't call them Word, Excel, and PowerPoint anymore. But that is what it looks like Adobe's doing with this suite of products that's going to be getting more and more tightly integrated with every generational improvement. So, come on, Apple. I'm sort of rooting for you here. Sort of. Not I'm really. not, but they yeah. can still do it. Um, are you, am I using Chrome Remote Desktop on your laptop? No, I'm not. I'm using an HDMI capture device. But that would be a phenomenally cool way of doing this. Uh, about YouTube subs, I couldn't even find that Twitch was running until I actually checked the web page. 
Ugh. Can one of you explain what a gaming keys are used for? I3 plus 650 Ti or I5 with 650 non-Ti? I'd go I3 with 650 Ti. What about you? Depends on its use case, but yeah, probably. What monitors do you each use? I'm using some ancient BenQ thing, but I have two Asus PV278s, so 27-inch, 2560x1440s, inbound. I have PA248Qs. So we both use Asus um, IPS panels. I really, although at that same point in time, if you're going oh. for a cheaper IPS panel, LG makes a lot of really good IPS That's panels true. that are cheap. Acer has some really nice IPS cheapo monitors these days. So just like... Just because we use Asus monitors doesn't mean that's all you should go for. With the Xbox One and PS4 both being AMD-based, do you think there will be more games optimized for an AMD-based system? No. Um, is Haswell good enough for PC gaming? Yes. 3 a.m. watching the WAN show. All right. I saw that EA article. Knew you guys were going to mention it. <laughs> Yay! Yeah! Boom. Love it. Would a 660 be good for 1080p gaming? It would be okay. I wouldn't expect it to last a real long time, especially with new consoles They're launching. so cheap now, though. Have they you seen the price drops yes. on them? People are getting them for, like, incredibly low amounts of money. All right. 7970 Matrix Edition versus GTX 780. GTX 780. A tasty PC has actually declined. I haven't reached out to Corsair George yet, but that's a great idea, and I really want to do that. And JJ will be joining us next week. Yep. Corsair George is a great idea. That's a great idea. Yeah. I really like George. He's mm -hmm. awesome. I love the new format of the live stream. Seems much more professional and fluid, except for that bit where we couldn't get Lou's uh, mic going thanks to Windows automatically adjusting the sound. Yeah, I was like, people can hear him, but he's low. Right? I know. That's bizarre, right? Yeah. I, I know that's a thing that happens. I just never really thought about the process because it's lowering XSplit's volume, which shouldn't really... Anyways. Yeah. Do you have Maximus 6 Formula in the mail? Not yet, although I should probably bug JJ about it because I'm really excited about it. You're talking about it on the live stream, so he has all that pressure. Yeah, so he has no choice but to send us a Maximus 6 Formula. Uh, those won't fit in my case? Okay. Then get something else. NHD 14 or Silver Arrow. What are some cool things I can fill my PCI slots with? Sound card. Yeah, get a sound card. You can still get a lot of PCI sound cards. You can get a Zoner SDX PCI. You know what? There's not much to put in an expansion slot these days. I have a sound card and a RAID card. Sound RAID video. Yeah. USB expansion. Ah, yes. So this is for the system for Mr. Wizard, one of our administrators on the Linus Tech Tips forum. Um, we, uh, we arranged for him to get a 6-core Extreme Edition 980X system. The one problem with that system is it didn't have an internal USB 3 header to run to the USB 3 front panel port, so we picked up this Silverstone card. What was it, 30 bucks? It, it was, like, I think 20 or 25, but then with shipping and taxes and everything, it became PCIe around 40 Gen bucks. 2. It's so good. they should be able to get full bandwidth. No, it's like, it's a nice card. Silverstone's that company that just doesn't get enough credit for the cool stuff they do. Because other companies have made these, but one thing I found about this is, is it had everything. Yeah, the Not internal everything header. Not had everything. And the external ports. Yeah, and like, oh yeah. Yeah, That's Silverstone, awesome. they just, I wish they would market better. <coughs> it's like what Lou was saying, where at the end of the day, this can be the best USB expansion card on the market, and if Silverstone doesn't figure out how to make people desire it, with whether it's a flashy campaign or whatever else, no one will ever know. Yeah, because my, my computer that I hold to LANs is an old 775 platform that still performs fairly well. But the case has USB 3 on it, and there's just a dead port because yeah. I can't... Now that I've seen this, I'm kind of like, ooh, if I buy one of those, that could really bring... Some, buy one of those and an SSD, that could really breathe life back into that system. But you hadn't even heard of the bloody thing up till now. Neither of us had. Neither who, of us. Who I knows? No like, it's cool that it exists, but I'd never actually, I'd never needed one, so I'd never looked for one, and no one has ever told me anything about it because no one seems to care. Okay, well, we should probably do build of the week because we've been streaming for an hour and a half already. Over. Sure. So bring it on, builds of the week. We've got three this week actually because a certain user on our forum keeps on getting in here, but I can't leave him out because his builds are too good. So I didn't want to, like, just have it so every time he builds something, someone gets knocked off a of build of the week. So I threw him in there on the end, not because he isn't deserving, but because he's already been in twice. <laughs> okay. So we'll, we'll see when we get there. So just so you guys know, builds of the week, 
are in the build log section of the forum. You can check them out there. And in the Linus News and Ramblings or whatever section, I'm going to post our entire WAN show document so you can click any of the links of any of the articles that we were discussing and all that good stuff. So let's switch over here and boom, Arc Underwater. So this Ooh. is by Fail Wheel Drive. I see a lot of people do green builds, but I don't necessarily see a lot of people do green builds that well. This it just looks super sharp. He had to do a couple custom cuts. I know he had to do some custom cuts to his ODD uh, bays yeah, to fit I see in that, that up here. radiator. Yeah, so just super sharp, super clean, and I love this. It's builds like this. Like I, I try and pick the best picture I possibly can, but you guys really need to go to the forum and check out the thread because he has a ton of really nice photos, and it doesn't justify it to be in one picture. Right. Okay. And, um, so, so please go check this guy's build out. It's awesome. That is gorgeous. Look at Super this. Look clean. at this great pump res combo he's got going on here. Yeah. That makes it extremely clean. You've eliminated a couple of components. He's got it uh, right. It looks like it's bolted to the radiator. Very nice. Really, really clean build. Looks really sharp. And he did green well, which really, like, I know I already said that, but green can look kind of tacky sometimes. Yeah. And I, I like the the color that he picked for it and everything. Now this one. I picked an interesting angle for the picture, but you'll notice immediately why I picked There's that angle. There's a window angle. in the top. There's a window in the top. There's it, The whole color of the theme is very dusty. Interesting. So he's gone with a saber tooth, or rather a, uh, a tough series AMD board by the look of things. Is that what that is? Or no, has he colored the heat sinks? What is this? He's done a lot of stuff. He's cut the back out here on the on the on the uh, right side panel. He's actually printed Tomb Raider in big printing, which looks really good. And he went with the red and black text, which I think was actually a good idea because that's how it is in their logo. Altara Although it would drives. suit the build better if it was all black. Now again, please go look at this guy's thread because you can get other angles. I had to show that top window because that's so cool. But if you can actually get in there in the computer, you can see his color theming on everything, and it's. Awesome. Look at that. He got right to the edge with that top window. That's very unique. I've never seen anything quite like that. Super, super cool. You know what probably my favorite modded build is ever? Also kind of window related. Someone did, uh, do you remember the P182SE? That mirror finish yeah. Antec case? Someone got a, a two-way mirror and did a, a side panel window on it that if the lights inside were off was a mirror yeah. and when he turned on the lights inside you could see all the internal components it was for sale on like red flag deals or something and i was like gonna buy it in win has a case like that now it's like 700 bucks though oh wow now it's snaff this is the guy who's been here a few times wow his builds are always amazing i can't leave them out of build logs of the week but then i don't really want them to take over other people's chances Again, tons of different angles. I pitch, I chose this one because it shows the intricacy, intricacy of his tubing, because that's insane. Wow, that is just unbelievable. The planning that goes into this. Nice straight insane. runs always look so much better than curved runs. It's just the truth. And like he 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 made a custom label for his SSD and a custom label for his power supply, that both go with the purple Chimera theme. Wow. Super nice. Yeah, that's outstanding. I, I've heard through multiple channels that he had to sell this one, which is unfortunate. But, huh. I mean, and like the graphics card looks super nice. You got But you got to see it from the other side. So wow. definitely, again, check out this thread on the forum. And yeah, build logs of the week this week. Pretty freaking cool. Yeah, that was a, that was quite the run of awesome build logs this week. All right, guys, I think that pretty much wraps it up. Uh, thank you for tuning into the WAN show this week. Guys, uh, stay tuned for the after party, although it might be a bit of a shorter version of the after party. And is that it? Thanks for watching. Yeah, hopefully I didn't embarrass myself too badly with that story at the beginning. Do we have to do a outro? The video outro? All right. <laughs>